Welcome to the CSSN channel. Our topic for today is the science behind the corona cough and cough from other viral infections of the lungs. My name is Abuzar Habibinia. I have an MD degree and I'm the director of the Canadian Academy of Sport Nutrition. Subscribe to the CSSN channel on YouTube to enjoy the information that we share on a regular basis about medicine, weight loss, fitness, and sport nutrition. Cough from viral infections of the lungs, including coronavirus. Why it happens? How it happens? Can we actually decrease the severity of cough? These are the things that you are going to learn them today. Cough is a natural reflex of the human body to protect the airways and the lungs from accumulation of secretions and from entry of irritating and destructive substances. It is basically one of the primary defense mechanisms of the lungs. Even though cough is a sort of protective mechanism, but if they are frequent and prolonged, they can be definitely exhausting and even painful, and they can impose undesirable effects on the cardiovascular and respiratory systems. Please keep in mind that cough is the symptom only, and medical practitioners around the globe cannot and should not diagnose just based on cough. They have to collect many other positive findings to come up with the final diagnosis. And there's no specific type of cough indicating a certain diagnosis. But definitely, the nature of cough can give a clue to the practitioners what the potential cause might be. The cough from coronavirus infection is dry. In general, there's no phlegm or mucus. They come back to back. Basically, they come in cluster, then there is a pause, they come again. For this presentation, I have used many references, medical books and articles, and I will list them at the end of this presentation and also in the description of the video on YouTube. Because the science behind the cough is very complex, today we have changed the way we are going to deliver to you the information. I have created amazing slides for you. I will talk on the slides and I will back at the end. Because there are small and tiny writings on the slides, I suggest you watch this presentation on a little bit bigger screen so you could see everything clearly. Let's go with the slides. There are about 200 different types of viruses that can cause upper respiratory symptoms and common cold. As you can see on this slide, rhinovirus with minimum 100 immunotypes is the most common reason for common cold. About 30 to 40 percent of cases of common cold, they are because of rhinovirus. Then we have over there influenza virus, parainfluenza virus, and coronavirus. Before this outbreak happens, I can say that a coronavirus was responsible for about 10 to 15 percent of cases of common cold in general. Then other virus and RSV. RSV is a kind of virus that, that basically can cause upper respiratory symptoms, especially among children, elderly people, and those people with weak immune systems. But let's keep in mind that all these viruses uh, they can cause non-specific signs and uh, symptoms and definitely one of those symptoms is basically cough. But let's see what is cough reflex. Okay, this is an illustration of cough reflex and you need to know because later on I'm going to show you how uh, by interfering with this cough reflex, we are going to decrease the severity of cough. As you can see on the slides, in your lungs, there are sensory endings and basically C fibers. Those uh, sensory nerve endings and C fibers, they are sort of receptors for chemical and mechanical irritants. Today, you're going to learn two important chemical irritants for sure and mechanical irritants if I give you example would be something like particulates in air pollution so 
chemical and mechanical irritants they are going to stimulate those receptors then signals will be carried to the brain by this nerve we call it in medicine the vagus nerve the vagus nerve is the cranial nerve number uh, 10 signals will be carried back by the vagus nerve to the brain to the cough center the cough center is located in a part of brain it is called medulla oblongata medulla oblongata is a part of the brain stem then the signals and uh, commands will be carried back to the airways and lungs through the same nerve the vagus nerve it is interesting to know that the signals uh, from the organs that basically they're gonna go from the organs to the brain uh, we call them afferent nerve fibers so those nerve fibers that they are going to take signals from the organs to the brain we call them afferent and those uh, nerve fibers that they're gonna carry back the signals from the brain to the organs we call them efferent nerve fibers so when signals and commands uh, got carried back to the airways they are going to lead to a rapid sequence of events which is going to lead to cough what happen is this you are going to inhale rapidly up to 2.5 liters of air into your lungs then your epiglottis and vocal cords will close tightly to entrap the air inside your lungs then your abdominal and other uh, expiratory muscles will contract forcefully pushing against the diaphragm which is going to increase the pressure inside your lungs as much as 100 mmhg then what happens next is this the epiglottis and vocal cords uh, will open suddenly and widely expelling out the trap air which we call it cough so this was cough reflex and you need to know for sure because later on I'm gonna show you uh, basically what happens in here exactly in terms of uh, physiology and biochemistry and how we are going to interfere with cough reflex to decrease cough in general when there is inflammation of the lungs which could be because of the viral or bacterial reasons that inflammation is going to lead to overactivity of something in medicine we call it the kinin system sometimes you know it is pronounced kinin system whatever you are comfortable with i'm gonna go with the kinin system so when we have inflammation of the lungs or airways we're gonna have an overactive kinin system then we are going to have excessive production and accumulation of bradykinin and substance p these two bradykinin and substance p are the two most important cytokines in lung inflammation lung lung infections and basically these two uh, cytokines we are going to blame for cough then those uh, cytokines bradykinin and substance p they are going to stimulate cough reflex definitely then you're gonna cough but let's take a deeper look into the kidney system what it is basically how it functions and its connection to some other uh, systems okay this is the kidney system in your body the kidney system is a sort of the core of any inflammation and definitely uh, the main culprit for cough as you can see on this slide in your blood there is a protein it's called plasma precalicrion which is going to convert to plasma calicrion then plasma calicrion is going to convert hmw kinogen to bradykinin remember bradykinin is the main reason for cough there are other cytokines are involved one of them i have put in here substance p there are some other cytokines and I didn't want to include them in here because they had basically minor rule. And some bradykinin is going to come from LMW kinogen. So when your body is produced bradykinin, bradykinin 
will be destroyed will be degraded by two enzymes in your lungs we call them kinase 1 and kinase 2 kinase 2 uh, is basically identical to another enzyme it's called ACE AC stands for angiotensin converting enzyme so these two enzymes kinase 1 and kinase 2 they are going to destroy they are going to basically uh, convert bradykinin into inactive peptides also this enzyme kinase 2 uh, can break down substance b remember substance b is one of the cytokines responsible for cough is released from the sensory nerve endings and also when the level of bradykinin increases definitely is going to increase the level of substance p as well so kinase 2 is responsible for destroying bradykinin and substance p and also in here we have kinase 1 you may ask yourself so if my body is producing bradykinin uh, basically continuously how come i am not coughing all the time that's a good question because there is a perfect balance between the production and destruction of kinin in your body what happened is this because when your body is produced kinin bradykinin sorry bradykinin is not gonna stay in your body for too long bradykinin has a very short half life when bradykinin is produced through this cascade of reactions then kinin is one and kinin is two they are going to basically destroy it that's why you don't cough all the time this enzyme in here, AC kinase 2, has connection to another system. That system in medicine we call it uh, the renin angiotensin system. Okay, let's take a deeper look what the renin angiotensin system exactly is. Okay, this is the kinase system. Now you know. And this is the renin angiotensin system. Okay, in the renin angiotensin system, this uh, hormone, which is called angiotensinogen, is produced by the liver. It's going to convert to angiotensin 1. This is done under the influence of renin. Renin is another protein that is produced by the kidneys. So renin is going to convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. And angiotensin 1 will be converted to angiotensin 2 by this enzyme, ACE. Then angiotensin 2, through you know a cascade of reaction, is going to basically regulate your blood pressure. Also, in here we have another enzyme, it is called ACE2. You see, this is called ACE, this is called ACE2. I wish you know they had called this one ACE. E1 because sometimes uh, medical students maybe sometimes those basically outdated uh, MDs they get confused you see ACE is responsible for converting angio angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 but ACE2 is going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 1 9 and angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 7 you see, this is the kinase system and this is the renin angiotensin system, which plays an important role in regulating your uh, blood pressure. I put these two systems uh, together and you needed to know here is the reason. When someone develops COVID 19, when someone develops uh, infection with coronavirus, that nasty virus is going to target these two systems okay let's see if someone develops coronavirus infection which part of these two systems will be affected okay you see sars coronavirus type 2 which is responsible for uh, covid 19 is going actually to sit on ace2 receptors basically uh, the receptors for the enzyme ACE2, they act uh, as a sort of docking site for coronavirus infection. And recent studies shows, few recent studies show that 
if you have a vitamin D deficiency and if you don't have a decent amount of vitamin D in your uh, system, what happens is this. The receptors for ACE2, they will be overexpressed. That means they're going to be more sensitive to coronavirus uh, infection. And also in here, something else happens because of the uh, virus attack. We are going to have a tissue damage in the lung. Tissue damage in the lungs, uh, they are going to activate this protein. That protein is called factor 12. A stands for activated. Actually, this is a kind of protein uh, that is produced by the liver. Sometimes it's called Hageman factor. It is a coagulating factor. So when factor 12 got activated because of the tissue damage, which comes from uh, basically virus attack, is going to speed up this cascade of reaction. Then we can have over there too much production of bradykinin. The production is going to be too high in a way that these two enzymes, kinase 1, kinase 2, cannot catch up with basically destruction. So the production is going to dominate the destruction. So uh, production of bradykinin is going to go up. And when bradykinin level goes up, the level of substance P is going to go up. And also I put in here something uh, ZN. ZN stands for zinc. This enzyme, ACE kinase 2, relies on zinc to break down bradykinin. So imagine if you have zinc deficiency, you don't have a right amount of zinc in your body, what's going to happen? Definitely ACE kinase 2 cannot function properly. This is one of the reasons that usually when you cough, when you have a cold, usually people, you know, they go to buy zinc lozenges. Okay, now you know when someone develops uh, infection, the coronavirus infection, which part of the kidney system and the, the system, the renin angiotensin system will be affected. Since we are talking about the kidney system and cough, let's take away the renin angiotensin systems for now because I don't want you get confused. Okay, now we have this one, an overactive kinin system. Tissue damage because a virus is going to activate factor 12. Factor 12 is going to speed up the production of broad kinin in a way that kinase 1 and kinase 2 AC cannot catch up with the production so the level of bradykinin uh, and also substance p will go up and when the level of this cytokines uh, bradykinin and substance p they are high they are going to stimulate those receptors uh, in the lung you know in in medicine there is a group of medications they are called ace inhibitors those medications are prescribed to lower blood pressure in those people with high blood pressure. I have listed in here for you three of them, captopril, lisinopril, and ramipril. So when someone is taking any of those AC inhibitors, well, what happens is this. Basically, you are blocking ACE enzyme kinase 2 to lower your blood pressure. But one of the functions of this enzyme was this to destroy bradykinin. So when you are taking any of these medications, basically you are blocking this enzyme, so kinase uh, 1 by itself will not be able to basically destroy uh, bradykinin properly, so bradykinin level is gonna go up. Actually, even if someone doesn't have coronavirus infection, but someone is taking any of this medication for high blood pressure, what happens is this, because you are blocking this enzyme, bradykinin level go up. That's why one of the side effects of those medication in medicine is actually uh, coughing. Okay, now you know bradykinin and substance P level increases for two reasons. Increased production and decreased degradation or breaking down. 
In medicine, bradykinin has long been known to produce the four classic symptoms of inflammation, you know, pain, redness, swelling, and local heat. You know, imagine if someone uh, has uh, basically uh, ankle sprain, you can have over there swelling, redness, pain, and local heat. Now you know what to blame for. It is the broad kinin that is causing those four classic symptoms of uh, inflammation. Okay, let's see when you have too much broad kinin and substance P in your system, what can happen? Let's go with substance P. You see, substance P is going to stimulate cough reflex, then you're gonna cough. Substance P is also responsible for pain, vasodilation, and vomiting, actually, the vomiting center and the cough center they are very close to each other this is why you know those people they cough frequently they cough back to back they cough too much uh, they might end up vomiting and also bradykinin is responsible for cough the main reason for cough is bradykinin and actually uh, in medicine they blame uh, bradykinin for pain so the main reason for pain is again is Bradykinin and vasodilation, you see, airways constriction. You see, when someone develops a viral infections of the lung, some uh, clients, some patients, they might develop shortness of breath. Now you know one of the, one of the basically cytokines you could blame is bradykinin. And also bradykinin can increase the permeability of weasels, uh, basically, which is going to leakage of the fluids to outside. These two cytokines, bradykinin and substance P, they play a major role in something in medicine which we call a cytokine store. Okay, let's see how to decrease cough by interfering with cough reflex. Okay, before I show you how we are going to interfere uh, with cough reflex to decrease the severity of cough, let me tell you something very, very interesting. There is a one single food item that if you are coughing because of the viral infection, if you are coughing because of allergy, if you are coughing because of asthma, it's better you stay away from that food item. Do you know what is that food item? I'm sure you will be surprised to see that food item is chili peppers. That is absolutely true. Here is the reason. Chili peppers contains something it's called capsaicin capsaicin is the active ingredient of chili peppers you know when you have chili peppers uh, you feel sort of hot you have that burning sensation in your mouth now you know where does it come from it because of the capsaicin which is the key ingredient in chili peppers well let's see how capsaicin basically can uh, stimulate calf reflex capsaicin has actually two opposite effects on the body as you can see on this slide capsaicin has topical effect and systemic effect you see if you use capsaicin topically what happens is this is going to uh, decrease substance p remember in medicine we blame substance p for pain this is why capsaicin creams they have been approved in medicine for post herpetic neuralgia basically those people uh, they have a uh, shingle zone it's very painful capsaicin creams definitely are useful for them and also capsaicin creams uh, can help people with painful diabetic neuropathy you know those people they have diabetes some of them in the long term they might develop neuropathy which is painful and definitely capsaicin creams uh, can help them but in here you can see capsaicin has a systemic effect as well imagine you are having one or two handfuls of chili peppers because you are going to provide your body uh, lots of capsaicin capsaicin is going to stimulate the release of substance p from sensory neurons you see uh, in topical effect substance p goes down but in systemic effect substance p is gonna go up and something interesting about capsaicin 
and you might be surprised to hear actually capsaicin is a banned substance in horse racing you heard it right capsaicin is a banned substance in horse racing usually they apply capsaicin cream to ease the symptoms of lameness and arthritis and if a horse test was positive for capsaicin the horse and the rider will be banned from competition uh, you know one to two years this is why if you are coughing because of viral infections of any kind if you are coughing because of asthma if you are coughing because of allergy it's better you stay away from having capsaicin for a while okay this was cough reflex that i showed you at the beginning now you know two chemical irritants in viral infections uh bradykin and substance p and also mechanical irritants such as particulates uh in air pollution they are going to stimulate those receptors in your lungs then the signals will be carried to the cough center in the brain then the signals that commands they will go back so the airways and the lungs they are going to lead to a, a rapid sequence of events which is called cough this is a sum up of what we have discussed so far we have an overactive uh kinin system in the lungs because of a virus infection which is going to stimulate those receptors and signals they're going to go to their brains signals they will come back to the airways to cause cough we are going to basically involve somewhere in here to decrease cough where you see to decrease cough we can involve in location one or we can involve in location two location one is basically in the brain and location two involving interfering with the kinin system okay let's see uh, what kind of medications uh, or nutrients basically can suppress cough by working on the brain but before I show you that please keep in mind that cough is a defense reflex whenever possible practitioners should treat the underlying cause not the cough itself Okay, there is a medication in medicine which is called dextromethorphan. You can see here, this is probably uh, the most commonly prescribed medication worldwide for cough. Dextromethorphan actually is going to work on location one. Dextromethorphan is going to act uh, in the cough center in the brain. You see, imagine that you have a viral infection of the lung of any kind, coronavirus infection, adenovirus infection, or in general, you have a common cold and you are coughing. So if you take dextromethorphan to suppress cough, what happens? You see, we know that the reason for your cough is an overactive kidney system in your lungs. You are silencing the brain. You are just telling the brain just shut up but the main reason for uh, your cough is still uh, is still there so this is why usually uh, dextromethorphan doesn't look uh, reasonable basically uh, to be prescribed for those people that uh, they have they are coughing because of the long long infection okay dextromethorphan actually is an over-the-counter medication that means you don't need prescription you can go to any drugstore and pick it up from there. Dextromethorphan is usually included in many cough uh, medications. And as I said, it is going to work uh, basically in, in the brain. And please keep in mind that dextromethorphan is banned under six years old. And also by those people, they are taking MAO inhibitors. MAO inhibitors, that are a group of medications that prescribed for those people, they have depression and potential side effects include confusion excitement irritability nervousness and serotonin syndrome which is uh, rare there are some other cough suppressants as well 
codeine and hydrocodone. Actually, for codeine and hydrocodone, definitely you're going to need prescription because they are narcotics. And like dextromethorphan, they work in the cuff center. Codeine and hydrocodone can cause drowsiness and constipation. And because of their potential for, you can see here, addictive dependence, uh, usually they are not desirable medications in the long term. There is another medication for cough. You can see here on this slide, it's called benzonatate. Benzonatate doesn't work on the brain like codeine, hydrocodone, and dextromethorphan. Benzonatate blocks the activity of sensory nerve endings in the lungs. Basically, benzonatate it is sort of local anesthetics. And because its effectiveness is variable and unpredictable, this is why benzonatate is not available in many countries. And something interesting about benzonatate is this. Uh, usually, benzonatate is prescribed uh, for cough from uh, lung cancer. Okay, I have a news for those uh, practitioners who keep prescribing dextromethorphan and for those people that anytime they cough, they just rush to a store to get dextromethorphan. You see, this is from the most famous uh, textbook in uh, pharmacology in medicine. It's famous as Goodman and Tillman. You see, I have highlighted in here for you. We're going to read together. Over-the-counter cough medications containing dextromethorphan are largely ineffective, although they are widely used. I am afraid that those uh, cough medications that you see out there that they contain dextromethorphan, most of them actually, they don't work. Okay. Now you know dextromethorphan, codeine, and hydrocodone, they work on the brain to decrease cough and... Uh, benzonatate, which is a sort of uh, local anesthetic, is going to uh, desensitize those receptors in your lung. But what about the kidney system? Now you know when you have any viral infection of the lungs and you are coughing, the reason is an overactive kidney system and excessive production of bradykinin and substance P. So if we decrease the levels of bradykinin and substance P, definitely your cough is going to decrease. There is a unique substance, there is a unique nutrient that is going to target the kinin system. And I'm sure you will be surprised to hear what it is. It is bromelain. You heard it right. Bromelain is very famous in integrative medicine and alternative medicine as a powerful anti-inflammatory agent. Actually, bromelain is going to target the kinin system through two different mechanisms to decrease the levels of bradykinin and substance P. You see, bromelain, first of all, is going to affect factor 12 and is going to basically decrease the production of bradykinin. And the second mechanism is this. Bromelain is going to help kinase 1 and kinase 2 to increase destruction. So uh, bromelain, by decreasing the production of bradykinin and also increasing its destruction is going to lower the levels of bradykinin and also substance P. Bromelain is a proteolytic enzyme extracted from the stems of pineapples. It is a sort of plant-based uh, enzyme, yet basically you can find mostly in the stems of pineapple, uh, fruits, pineapple itself, you know, uh, has some bromelain, but not as much as the stems. Actually, bromelain has four important activities. You can see here, uh, bromelain has anti-inflammatory, anti-thrombotic, and fibrinolytic and mucolytic activities. Anti-thrombotic means this, that bromelain has a sort of blood thinning effect. And also mucolytic means that if there is a mucus inside, if there is a flame, bromelain uh, basically can thin the mucus to come out easily and actually there are uh, lots of research uh, paper in the medical literature uh, about bromelain and 
Lots of studies show that bromelain can enhance the absorption of many antibiotics and definitely uh, lots of people they take bromelain you know uh, for the indigestion. Unfortunately, bromelain has not been approved by any medical establishment for the treatment of any diseases. However, it is usually sold as food supplements. Usually they come 500 milligrams, anywhere between 400 to 1000 milligrams, but most commonly you can see as 500 milligrams, uh, which is some, most of the time it's alone or they have mixed with some other anti-inflammatory nutrients such as curcumin and vitamin C. Because bromelain is is a sort of enzyme that's why bromelain is measured in three different units uh, MCU GDU and FCC PU usually uh, recently most manufacturers they use the last one FCC PU and here are the unit conversions uh, 1 GDU equals approximately 1.5 MCU and 1 GDU equals 15,000 FCC PU usually when you're going to buy uh, bromelain as a supplement you don't need to know those uh, basically units and conversions the label is gonna tell you can we enhance the effectiveness of bromelain now you know that bromelain by decreasing the production of bradykinin and substance p and increasing the destruction of uh, bradykinin shows anti-inflammatory activity and also can lower cough but can we enhance the effectiveness of bromelain the answer is yes we can again there is a unique nutrient or substance that usually they work hand in hand with bromelain to decrease inflammation and decrease cough let's see what are those uh, nutrients polyphenols that is absolutely true you know polyphenols they're a diverse group of phytochemicals that contribute to the aroma taste and color of fruits and vegetables for example the color of pomegranate the aroma of uh, berries they are because of polyphenols and they are actually very powerful anti-inflammatory agents and in medicine and nutrition they have identified thousands of polyphenols the most famous one is called French maritime pine bark extract this is a public term its trade name is pycnogenol and its scientific name is OPC or oligomeric proanthocyanidins I mean if you see OPC pycnogenol or French maritime pine bark extract they are pretty much the same thing and Pycnogenol is the most studied polyphenol in medicine. There are over 200 research papers about it. And definitely polyphenols, they are working hand in hand with bromelain to decrease inflammation and decrease cough. So, according to the information and data we have collected here from about 67 references, we can tell that the science says that a combination of bromelain and pycnogenol may be a novel adjuvant protocol in cough from viral infections of the lung. And remember, if you are planning to take bromelain or a combination of bromelain and pycnogenol for any inflammation or your cough, you should always consult your practitioner. I really hope you learned something interesting today. Because we make science easy to understand, now you know. If you don't want to miss the video that we post on a regular basis on CSSN channel, you can subscribe to our channel. To support us, you can share, like, or comment on this video. Until next time, stay safe, stay protected, and stay home for now.